The designers of the 2024 Carnival set a pretty high bar for this vehicle because they want you to think of this not just as a minivan mommy mobile, but also a practical alternative to the average crossover or SUV. And that's why they've styled the outside and the inside with a few SUV styling cues. But does that disrupt the core mission of the Carnival as a minivan? Let's find out. Minivans have an interesting reputation, and let me just say I've always found the use of minivan mommy as a semi-derogatory term a little bit perplexing because statistically every human alive today has a mom, because otherwise we wouldn't exist. But for some reason, humans definitely seem to think that we shouldn't drive what our parents drove, whether that's a station wagon or a minivan, unless somehow it's an SUV. That is the one automotive form that has somehow transcended that I don't want to drive what my mom drove, I don't want to drive what my dad drove thing. And that's part of why Kia went in this direction with the Carnival. Up front, they certainly gave it a much more distinctive look than we find in the other minivans available in North America. And I have to say, it is certainly the most handsome one, at least to my eye. Definitely more attractive than the Pacifica, which is getting a little on the old side. And I do think that the Sienna looks a little bit funky from some angles. The front end design is going to change depending on the trim level you get. This is the top end trim, so we get full of the headlights and this sort of lightning bolt accent strip that functions as a DRL and then turn signals right there. We also get LED fog lights below and a different interpretation of the Kia Tiger Nose grille. The Tiger Nose grille takes different forms in different Kias. In this one, the hood actually drops down there, pinching in that grille portion. With this headlight arrangement, the high beams and low beams are separated. This is the high beam module. This is the low beam module on the outside. As you can see, the DRL becomes the turn signal when that's activated. If the angled pillar looks familiar, that's because it probably is. SUVs have been using this particular design for quite a while, and that's exactly why Kia imitated it. Statistically speaking, every minivan owner in America has a mom, but not every minivan owner in America has kids. And that's why top-end trims of the Carnival, the Sienna, and the Pacifica especially are really focusing on second-row accommodations for adults. Yes, there's a ton of family friendliness going on in the Carnival and in the Sienna and Pacifica, but this has powered second-row seats that are just about as comfortable and as roomy as the front-row seats. And that's all possible because of the form of the modern minivan. Nice high roof, relatively low ground clearance compared to a three-row SUV gives you a really, really tall box. And that means greater headroom, greater legroom, greater comfort, etc. But that boxy shape is something that folks don't seem to like with minivans. So Kia tries to disguise it with styling. Sliding doors like this need an external track, but they've done their best to disguise it into the character line of the vehicle. They've also made it really slim, and they've given us this body color matching section up top, which integrates into the taillight to help disguise things further. But the big thing going on is still that kick-up swoosh. Now, this power sliding door uses three tracks. There's one on top, one in the middle externally, and then one at the bottom. But the top two are hidden by the door itself. Then to give it a little bit of extra SUV vibe, they give us a roof rack on top. Apparently nothing says sporty in the 21st century like black wheels. Of course we find them in the top end SX trim. I'm not the biggest fan of these wheels, especially the black design, but let me know what you think of that down there. They're wrapped in 235 55R19 tires. So they do give you about average cushioning versus the average three row SUV and pretty similar width to something like a Highlander or most versions of the Pilot, but not quite as wide as some of the newer, larger three row SUVs. Designing a box to look less like a box is pretty difficult. So if you're behind one of these on the road, there's no disguising that it's a minivan in front of you, even though we have this cool LED bar that runs from one side to the other. This does not contain the turn signals and backup lights, however. Those are incandescent and down lower on the bumper. I actually would have loved to have seen them integrated into these modules. Now, speaking of that low bumper, that really is the reason that minivans are so cargo practical, even versus bigger three-row SUVs like the new Grand Highlander. That bumper is really low because minivan designers don't have to worry about departure angles. And even in a Grand Highlander, they were wanting to give it a bit of off-road capability. So that bumper really pulls up quite a bit, really hampering the amount of cargo room you have in the back. Also, the roof lines tend to drop a little bit towards the rear, cutting down third row headroom, and yet again, cargo practicality. In the Carnival, of course, we have this really huge hatch. Let's check out how far it opens. 
As you can see, I'm six feet tall. I can go under it, but one flaw with some minivans is the height of this hatch. And if you're much taller than I am, you're probably gonna hit your head right there on that latch mechanism. Now, speaking of Carnival, a lot of folks are not a big fan of the name. Maybe you could car call it uh, Carnival if you wanted to, just don't call it a fiesta. Here's what's going on. Carnival is always what this minivan was called internationally. In the US, it was called Sedona. At some point, Kia thought, that's stupid, let's just make only Carnival badges, so we'll just call them all the same. That's the reason. Like most minivans in North America, this is powered by a naturally aspirated V6 engine. This one produces 290 horsepower, 262 pound-feet of torque. Pretty similar power and torque numbers to the Odyssey, and the Pacifica V6. But there are two other options in this segment that are interesting. We have the Sienna, which is hybrid only and four-cylinder hybrid only. It's the least powerful entry. And we have the Pacifica plug-in hybrid, which uses a variant of its V6 engine and a plug-in hybrid system. Interestingly, that is the most efficient entry in this segment in real-world driving, although according to the EPA, the Sienna is just a little bit higher. The rest of the minivan competition, they're all right here at about 22 miles per gallon combined. Also interesting for the Carnival, this eight-speed automatic transmission now is the least number of gears available in this segment. The Pacifica has a nine-speed automatic and the Odyssey has a 10-speed automatic, but honestly, there's not a lot of difference in terms of performance. And this eight-speed and the Odyssey's 10-speed are both a little bit less controversial than the nine-speed that the Pacifica uses. As often happens, the week after I filmed this video, but before we finished editing, Kia announced that not only are we getting a slight refresh for the Carnival for 2025, we are getting an all-important hybrid system available. It's going to be a 1.6 liter turbocharged hybrid borrowed out of the larger Kia Sorento and the Hyundai Santa Fe. It's going to produce 247 horsepower, 270 pound-feet of torque, and it's essentially that exact same hybrid system without the addition of all-wheel drive. So still front-wheel drive, but probably going to be near 30 miles per gallon, perhaps just a bit over. We'll keep you updated as we get more information on that upcoming hybrid system. If you want one, you might want to wait till 2025. Front seat comfort is definitely solid in this vehicle, although taller people should know that the seat bottom cushion is a little on the short side, possibly due to the average shopper demographic here. We have a tilt telescopic steering column with a large range of motion and, of course, a very upright seating position, something minivans have long been known for. So if you really want that commanding view of the road and you want to be able to sit in a position where you get a lot of thigh support, say for long road trips, you can definitely get pretty darn high in the Carnival. Uh, something that a lot of people don't necessarily realize. If you really like that more truck-like seating position, this is perhaps a little bit closer to a half-ton truck in terms of the seating position than the average three-row SUV because of the amount of headroom we have and just the way that the seat tracks themselves move. I also appreciate the fact that this top end trim has four-way adjustable lumbar support. Something that we've seen from Kia for a while that you should know is that the seat tracks do move pretty far rearward. So if you are a taller driver, you're definitely gonna be a bit more comfortable in here than something like the Sienna or the Odyssey. For me at least, there are two notable things in the second row. These second row seats, which are optional, mind you, are the most comfortable seats available in a minivan in North America. The other thing is kind of obvious above me, it's the fact that we have a second opening sunroof here. So we have a sunroof up front that opens, a sunroof behind that opens. Obviously it is powered and then it has a manual shade on it. This is one of very few vehicles in the world that actually has two opening glass panels in the roof. Although yes, it is a little bit smaller than some of those panoramic moonroof arrangements that you will find available. The other thing that's notable about this particular trim is the lounge seat option. This is a powered seat. If I press and hold this particular button, you can see what's going on. It not only has a recline, it also has an ottoman. Pardon the child seat sitting there. I'll talk about that in just one moment. The song and dance does take a bit. The seat is now in its most reclined position, and now the ottoman is coming up. So as you can see, lots of room here because these seats don't just have the powered ottoman, they also have a design that allows them to slide inboard and then slide further back to give you access to more second row room because the second row seats end up actually kind of between the rear wheel wells in the vehicle. Even in this position though, it should be obvious that these seats are really accommodating for child seats or families with kids because this is an enormous Kiko child seat. In a rear facing position, there is just tons of room. I don't even need to bother strapping it in to show you what that would look like. It's just pretty obvious that there is a ton of room going on there. The seats themselves, again, very, very comfortable. I'll show you how they slide. 
It's a manual slide forward and backward because that's a really long seat track. And then this other lever lets you slide inboard and outboard, kind of a novel design. They do still move rearward if you don't move them in, but if you wanna go further than this, you have to scoot in and then you can scoot back. It's worth noting that this handy feature doesn't just apply to the lounge seat model, it also applies to the regular second row seats in the less expensive versions of the Carnival. Now, one thing worth noting is that this does not have a mechanism that lets you leave a child seat latch anchored into a forward position and still flip and fold the seats to the third row. That's something that we do find in the Pacifica. So in this vehicle, you're left either trying to go around the middle or trying to squeeze right through there into the back, and that is kind of a tight squeeze. Also, the Pacifica is the only entry in this segment with second row seats that fold completely into the floor. You can't get that in the hybrid model, but it does improve cargo practicality in that regular Pacifica. Unfortunately, it has a significant negative impact on second row seat comfort because the seat has to be designed to flip and fold and that just makes it less cushy. When slid all the way back, the second row seats actually end up touching the third row, really making that third row unusable, but there's tons of leg room in here for everybody to be happy. With that second row seat slid back into its position there, Getting into the third row is a little bit trickier than some because I do have to go through the middle. There's just not enough room on the side for an adult to crawl through, but we have a pretty big third row back here versus even something like a Grand Highlander. This is a more comfortable third row. It's a bit wider. We have three seats back here and the seat bottom cushion is higher off the ground. Also helpful, the floor in here is almost completely flat. It does step down just a little bit to the front passenger footwells, but the second row footwell and this third row footwell, they're really only about three quarters of an inch apart. Headroom is pretty generous in this third row. My hair is touching the ceiling, but I have a pretty decent amount of recline. I pull a bit of webbing and this seat goes actually surprisingly far back. Although the recline mechanism happens in kind of an odd location in the seat back, I don't find that part overly comfortable, but it's pretty similar to most minivans as far as the third row seat goes. In a more natural seating position, my hair is just barely brushing the ceiling. There's plenty of room back here. Now, as far as room in the third row goes, for adults especially, the Odyssey, you should know, has a sort of rounded profile in the roof line in this area, and that means in the outboard seating positions, I just don't have enough room in the Odyssey to sit upright. My head is solidly digging into the ceiling, and it's not in the other minivans in the segment. Also, although the center shoulder belt comes out of the ceiling, it doesn't have as big of a bump as we find in the Honda Odyssey. The Odyssey has a lot of great attributes, but the third row is perhaps my least favorite in the minivan segment. Nice touch back here, we have outboard latch anchors for these two outboard seating positions, and even a fairly tall headrest for this third seat right there in the middle. Now, speaking of the middle, if you do plan on putting folks in the middle of a rear bench, you're gonna want a minivan over even some of the larger three row SUVs like a Grand Highlander. And that's because these wheel wells are pushed further out to the side. This is wider inside than a Grand Highlander or a Telluride or a Palisade or a Pilot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's how you can get four foot wide items inside the average American minivan, and that results in a wider third row that's certainly gonna be more comfortable. Nice touches in the rear include air vents up here in the ceiling, USB charge ports on the side, cup holders on either side, and integrated sunshades for the third row. Whether you're hauling kids, cargo, or crates for your litter of Labradoodles, the Carnival has an impressive amount of storage capacity, solidly above the average three-row SUV and the most in the minivan segment. But what's most interesting and impressive about this cargo area is how square it is. And that's the reason I was able to squeeze two more 24-inch roller bags back here than in any other minivan in North America. Because of the squareness, you can line up six roller bags easily down here in the cargo well and then squeeze two just above it, but still below the third row. There is a little bit of variance in the cargo capacity figures of the Pacifica, the Sienna, and the Odyssey, but they all score very similarly in my roller bag test because each of them has some sort of intrusion or another in the cargo area that prevents those boxier roller bags from actually fitting in the back. Going in for a closer look, you can see that with the third row seats folded, we have an almost flat cargo area in the back, and it's a fairly simple one-handed operation to get them up and down. That's it up, and then you just reverse the process to drop them back down there into the cargo well. Behind this door, we find the jack and the tire iron. The spare tire, yes, it does have one. That's just up there on the underside of the vehicle right by the sliding door. 
As we look around the interior, keep in mind this is the top end trim, so things like this dual power moonroof, they're not going to be on the base model, although I do think the base model is still pretty well equipped. We'll talk about that more in the pricing section. There is the front opening sunroof, and there is the larger second row opening sunroof. I am surprised that the one in the way back is actually bigger than the one up front. From this angle, you can really see just how far back that second row of seating slides. So if you're not a fan of your kids being able to kick the front seat back, that is one reason you might want to take a look at a minivan with those sliding second row seats. We have the integrated sunshades back there in the second and third rows. We have height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and the front passenger, and we have two-way adjustable head restraints for the front seats. This particular model also has the factory rear seat entertainment system, which is definitely an option that I would recommend skipping. I think it's just uh, easier and cheaper to go with iPads. We also find seat controls for the front passenger seat on the sides, that way you can move that forward and backward. I've always thought that was kind of an odd feature in family-focused vehicles because I could see kids playing with that quite frequently. That's certainly something I would have done as a kid. USB charge only port there, two big cup holders for the second row seats in the center console. And before we talk about the rest of the vehicle, we should talk about the center console because this is one of the un-minivan features in here and it is definitely a pro and a con. It certainly makes the dashboard look more like an SUV but it also removes a lot of the practicality that we've come to associate with minivans. You can see that under the center console, there's really nothing going on, no extra storage space. There is just a tiny little storage slot, I guess you could say, over there on the passenger side, but no big, huge storage area like we find in the rest of the minivan competition. On the other hand, we find a lot of premium touches in here, including heated and ventilated seats, leather upholstery, of course, and lots and lots of soft touch materials on the dashboard and doors, which is a little surprising. So this is an imitation leather insert. We then have a soft touch armrest there, soft upper section of that door. You will find more hard plastics in the Toyota Sienna, and also I think less of an attractive color palette. I do kind of like the combination of lighter and darker colors in here, although obviously you can get a charcoal on charcoal on charcoal model if you really want to. The dashboard, that is an injection molded piece up here, soft touch with faux stitching, so it's not actually stitched together, but it does improve the look. We get this uh, sort of imitation knurled metal trim in the middle, big chrome bar connecting the air vents, and then a pretty spacious glove compartment for a minivan. For some reason, minivans don't have terribly big glove compartments, although I was able to fit an 11 inch tablet computer inside. In the middle of everything, we of course have the touchscreen infotainment system that Kia has been known for for a while. Basically the same software in a wide variety of different vehicles and that same large 12.3 inch LCD instrument cluster over there. Obviously that one's not a touchscreen, this one is. The one downside to this system continues to be that Apple CarPlay and Android Auto are not wireless. That's something that we finally see in the new Kia EV9. Perhaps that hardware and software will make its way down to this system, but there was a hardware change to enable that particular feature. Now, uh, speaking of minivan features, we have passenger view here. That's one way you can check out what's going on back there in the second row seats, kind of a handy touch. If you want to check in on the little ones in the back seat, you can just double tap on a particular area and zoom in on that particular spot, but there's no really good way to see exactly what's going on in the third row. There's also a passenger intercom, so you can yell at the kids back there, tell them to stop kicking your seat back, but that is a one-way system, so there's no two-way intercom feature. You can also directly access that with that passenger talk button. Moving down from there, we have lots of shiny black plastic. You can really see it in the sunlight today. This big touchscreen area here, these are touch controls for the infotainment system, that's shiny black. And then this entire center console is full of shiny black plastic as well. We have toggles for the temperature. You can see the auto climate control there. You can also control the rear climate control zone from that spot. Below the button bank, we find the USB input for the infotainment system, some USB charge only ports, and a Qi wireless charging mat. Again, smartphone integration is wired, not wireless. More of that shiny black plastic going on here. Pretty traditional console shifter. Also occupies a bit more room than in some of the competition. Drive mode selector, auto brake hold, and then a button bank that is kind of similar to some other Kia models where we have toggles for the heated and ventilated seats, heated steering wheel, parking sensors, 360 degree camera button there, and two pretty decently sized cup holders. This has the same Kia key that we find in a number of different models. And then we have a soft touch armrest with sort of an average for an SUV amount of storage. I'm really curious to know what's going on under this center console because it is fairly large and in most minivans you'd be able to have storage all the way down to the floor, but not in the Carnival. 
Moving over to the driver's side of the dashboard, you can see no heads up display in this model, but we do have the large full color LCD instrument cluster. It has several different design themes. Most of them are dial designs, but I do like this particular look that we see in a number of other Kias. Moving out from there, we have a steering wheel that's surprisingly similar yet again to other Kia models. Infotainment buttons over here on the left side of the steering wheel, including a favorite button. And then on this side of the steering wheel, we find the controls for the radar adaptive cruise control and the aggressive lane centering system. I've commented before about the plague of shiny black plastic really infecting so many new car designs, and here's a good example of the amount that we find in this interior. I will say it does not appear to scratch quite as easily as the piano black plastics that we find, for instance, in a Jeep Grand Cherokee, but this is still an awful lot. There's a big panel right here where we also find the memory buttons for the front seats, and then all around these controls here, we have shiny black plastic. These high touch areas really increase the likelihood that you're gonna end up with fingernail scratches on things as you're pulling this door handle, or playing with those window switches. For some reason, there's a common perception that minivans are terrible to drive. They wallow like pigs, they're slow, they don't handle well, etc. But honestly, compared to the average three-row SUV, like a Grand Highlander or a Telluride or a Palisade, the average minivan is really not far off. Acceleration times in this model, 7.2 seconds. That is really shockingly similar to the Telluride and the rest of that three-row SUV competition, as is the stopping distance. It took this model 120 feet to stop from 60 miles an hour back to zero. That's a fairly solid showing, even though we have slightly narrower tires than we find on some of those three-row SUVs. Obviously, versus some of the rear-biased entries in this segment, like Durango, Grand Cherokee, Explorer, and CX-90, this is not gonna be quite as much fun to drive, but versus the bulk of the sales in this segment, Pilot, uh, Pathfinder, Highlander, etc., this is really not gonna be too far off. You will, however, notice that this feels bigger out on the road, and that's because it is bigger. In fact, if I stretch my arm out, I come maybe to the midsection of this passenger seat next to me, the cabin is certainly wider than average, so if you want something that feels roomier, you definitely want a minivan. And the difference is gonna be most noticeable in some of the comparisons to smaller three-row SUVs, like the regular Highlander, something like a Kia Sorento, et cetera, or even the new Santa Fe. Those are a little bit narrower than something like a Grand Highlander, and you will certainly notice that on the inside. When it comes to the handling score, I give the Carnival a B. Keep in mind, there are a ton of different factors involved when it comes to the handling score. It's not just tire size and curb weight, it's also suspension design, center of gravity, et cetera. This does really well in comparison to most three-row SUVs, but it's still gonna feel a little bit heavier, a little bit more ponderous out on the road. But sometimes it's also gonna feel a little bit more car-like, and that actually could be a good thing compared to something a little bit higher off the ground, something like a Grand Cherokee. If you don't really like that high center of gravity feeling that you'll get even in a rear-wheel drive biased entry like that, you might wanna check out something like this. It's certainly gonna be more roomy on the inside. And that roominess kind of makes this feel a little different when it comes to sharp handling because this seat is broader and it's flatter. And it means it's not gonna grip me quite as well as I go around some of these corners, but it actually does pretty well scooting around those corners. The lack of all wheel drive, however, is a little bit of a detriment when it comes to handling because it cannot send any power to the rear. So it's always gonna have those solid front power bias characteristics. As with most of the minivan competition, ride quality on a rougher road surface like the one that we're on here is excellent. This is definitely the kind of vehicle you want if you want to take your family on a long road trip and be comfortable even on poorly paved road surfaces. Bearing in mind that we are driving the top end version of the Carnival, cabin noise is very well controlled. I measured 70 decibels in here at 50 miles an hour, easily putting this among the quietest three row options in North America. If you want something a little bit quieter than this, you are gonna to have to step up considerably into something like a full size body on frame SUV but you may not actually get as much interior space inside. And that's probably the most interesting thing about minivans like this. You'll also lose a little bit of efficiency, depending of course on exactly which comparison you're trying to make. Because this is front wheel drive, not all wheel drive, there's less mechanical loss. Because this is closer to the ground, we have that lower ground clearance number, aerodynamics are generally speaking improved. And that's part of why I've actually been averaging 22 and a half miles per gallon, which is a solid score for a front wheel drive V6 entry, whether we're talking about something big like this or something a little bit smaller like a V6 front wheel drive Telluride. You won't really find appreciably better fuel economy even in the small turbo engines that are available now in the three row segment like the 2.4 liter turbo in the Highlander or the two liter turbo in the Volkswagen Atlas. Unfortunately, however, there are hybrid options and there are some really fantastic hybrid options out there. The Grand Highlander, the regular Highlander, 
and the Chrysler Pacifica plug-in hybrid. They will all give you significantly better fuel economy than this, nearly 50% better depending on your driving situation. And of course, the plug-in hybrid alternatives will also give you some EV range. I know some folks that have really been on the fence about whether or not to get a plug-in hybrid as a family vehicle like this. I actually think it's a fantastic idea because if you're worried about stopping and the inconvenience of dealing with screaming kids in the back while you're at the gas station, you're going to be doing that an awful lot less in a plug-in hybrid. And if you live in a cold area of the U.S., you can also remote start your vehicle in your garage when it's plugged in without gassing yourself to death because it's running on electricity in that instance. On the other hand, the plug-in hybrid options are generally speaking going to be more expensive. And whether or not you'll end up saving money over time really depends on a wide variety of factors, including can you charge it at home, are you interested in charging it at home, and exactly how you're going to drive and use the vehicle. I think it's easy to see why sales of the Carnival have been on a strong upward trajectory, name aside, of course, because it is less expensive than most of the minivans it's competing with. It starts at $34,995, and it's pretty well equipped in that base LX trim. There's just one little thing you should know. There's no eight-seat version of the LX, but interestingly, every other version of the Carnival has eight seats standard. If you get the very top-end trim, then you have the option of returning to a seven-seat minivan with captain's chairs in the second row. That's the model that we were testing, and that's the one with the VIP seats. Kind of a weird twist is that that is a no-cost option, so you choose whether you want the eight seats, which I think is more practical, or whether you want the VIP seats if you want to, I don't know, show off to your friends. We don't know 2025 pricing for the Carnival just yet, but expect it to be an incremental increase over 2024. We also don't know what the hybrid system is going to be priced, uh, but I expect it to be somewhere between $1,500 and $2,500. That should definitely still keep the Carnival as the least expensive entry in this particular segment. The Pacifica has become pretty expensive over the last few years, especially since they no longer make the Voyager version. Previously, there was a decontented Pacifica with a very slightly different front end design that was sold as the Voyager. Now that's going to be sold only to fleet customers. So if you're just going to roll into your Chrysler dealer and expect to buy a minivan, it's not going to have a Voyager logo. They're all going to be called the Pacifica. And at $40,685, it is definitely more expensive than the Carnival, but it is definitely the elephant in the room as well. So let's talk about this model first, or maybe I should say the gorilla in the room, because Chrysler has been at the minivan game for a really long time. And I think it still shows with the Pacifica, because there's some solid reasons to get this over the other entries. Practicality and pragmatic cargo hauling is definitely the biggest reason. This is the only entry in this segment where the second row seats fold flat into the floor, and it's the only entry that would let you leave a child seat forward-facing, latch anchored in a position, and still tilt and slide those seats forward for easier third row access. If you're seating three across in the second row of your minivan and you have kids in child seats, especially if you have two, one on each side, this is an incredibly valuable feature. And it's something that you just can't do in the competition. Yes, some of them you can slide the seats far enough forward that you could try and squeeze into the back. But if you have elderly grandparents that are trying to get back there, people with mobility issues, etc., it's simply going to be easier to do in the Pacifica. Now there's a downside to that, and that downside is that the second row stow and go seats are the least comfortable second row seats in this segment. And it's really no surprise because they have to be able to fold into the floor. Although when they're not folded into the floor, you also get all of that storage space available as well. And I know a lot of people that really find that storage area invaluable, especially on longer road trips. Well, it's true you can't put as many bags in the back of the Pacifica as you can in the Carnival. You can effectively store about the same amount of cargo under that floor in the second row. So if you're on a longer road trip, you're using the second row bench, you can put lots and lots of knickknacks under there. Also, currently the Pacifica is the only option in this segment with mechanical all-wheel drive. You can get all-wheel drive in the Sienna, but it's only the E all-wheel drive system. So if you're looking for the optimum in sure-footed snow or ice traction, it's certainly going to be the Pacifica. And it's the only model with the plug-in hybrid. That's definitely the version of the Pacifica I would get, but that plug-in hybrid system has become pretty expensive over time. Now, the only hybrid entry in this segment currently is the hybrid Sienna. That's going to be $39,080, so definitely more expensive than the Carnival, and I suspect more expensive than the upcoming hybrid Carnival in 2025 as well. 
The Sienna hybrid system does feel a little bit taxed because it's basically the RAV4 and Highlander hybrids hybrid system jammed into the Sienna. It has the higher power output from the Highlander, but remember that the engine is effectively the same. So there is going to be a point where you're climbing a hill and you've got under 200 horsepower on tap. That means that the Sienna is definitely the most uh, sluggish entry in the segment. It's certainly the slowest once that battery has been depleted. But in regular day-to-day -day driving, it feels a bit more peppy, with the exception that you're certainly hearing more of that four-cylinder sound come into the cabin. Now, I don't find that to be a problem, but I know some folks out there really don't like the thought of a four-cylinder engine in a vehicle like this. However, you will get some of the best fuel economy numbers in the segment. In our driving, as with most of the other outlets that have tested this back-to-back -back with a Pacifica plug-in, the Pacifica actually gets slightly better fuel economy, perhaps because of the V6 engine, but the two are very similar, and both of them are going to be significantly more fuel efficient than anything else. And even though you might not be a fan of hearing that four-cylinder engine all the time, statistically, it's probably going to be the most reliable minivan in this segment. Toyota's hybrids have been by far the most reliable entries in every segment that they're playing in, and the Sienna appears to be no different here. Also, if you want all-wheel drive, this is the only other option. However, it cannot send a great deal of power to the rear axle, so it's good for improving traction, but it's not really going to help you get unstuck should you get unstuck. It's going to be better than not having all-wheel drive at all, but just keep those e-all-wheel drive limitations in mind. I'm personally not a big fan of the styling of the Sienna, but I do love the way that they have jammed a ton of storage into the front row. There are nooks and crannies and cubbies and storage compartments everywhere up front. It's very, very practical. Now, on the downside, we have second row seats that don't come out of the minivan. And that means it's going to be a big, big deal for people that really want to use their minivan as family transport and cargo transport. It's going to be less practical. You can tilt and slide and collapse those seats forward. Oddly enough, not when a child seat is latch anchored into place, but either way, you still don't get as much interior room as you'll get in really every other minivan here except for the very top end version of the Carnival with the VIP seats. Those don't come out either. The last thing I should mention is that the Sienna still seems to be hard to find in some areas of the country, and its price tag definitely ratchets up pretty quickly. It'll end up over $57,600 when fully equipped. That is significantly more expensive than a fully loaded Carnival, nearly $8,000 more and significantly more expensive than our last option, which has to be the Honda Odyssey. The Odyssey over the decades has gained kind of a cult-like following in North America. I think it's easy to see why. It's one of the more stylish options, although it's definitely still a minivan. It also has that solid Honda V6 engine under the hood and definitely practical features. Toyota has gone in different directions with their minivans over the years, giving us the Previa, giving us the uh, supercharged engine, giving us the current generation Sienna, etc. Now going on with a four-cylinder hybrid in every trim, whereas Honda has just continued to hone and refine the formula, honestly, that made the Chrysler minivans so successful. On the downside, this generation of Odyssey is starting to feel pretty old, especially on the interior, where we have heavier seats in the second row. They do come out, but they are pretty heavy, and a dashboard design that definitely feels very old-school Honda. There have been some upgrades over the years here and there. We now have the excellent Honda 10-speed automatic transmission. Previously, it had the same ZF9 speed that we found in the Pacifica. Now it has the Honda 10-speed. That's a really nice change, but the software and the screens in the dashboard definitely have an older feel to them. And rather unfortunately, the Odyssey still lacks some of the family-friendly practicality features that we find in the competition. Yes, you can get the magic slide second row seats, so you can scoot the seats inboard and then forward a little bit for easier access to the third row, but you can't do that if you have the middle seat in the second row. There's still kind of a flaw there, depending on exactly how you're using the seating in the vehicle. So which minivan would I get if my own cash were on the line? I have to admit, I'm pretty torn right now. Once upon a time, I would have said Pacifica plug-in, but the plug-in Pacifica has become more expensive over the years, and with a starting price over $47,000, it starts practically where the carnival ends, and that is definitely a sticking point, and that is including the federal tax credit. Without it, it is significantly more expensive than really every other minivan in this group. There are those practical features and capabilities, but... I'm just not sure if it's enough to really warrant stepping up to the Pacifica plug-in. The reality, of course, on the Pacifica pricing is that there are going to be a ton of dealer discounts, and we're only talking MSRP here. So I would say if you could get another $7,000 off of that Pacifica plug-in, maybe $5,000 off, 
then I think it would still be a solid option. And that's definitely the direction I would go, assuming the deal was good enough. If it's not, I think I would be really torn between the Carnival and the Sienna. The Carnival, because I love the practical features. I love the fact that eight seats are standard in pretty much every trim except that base model. I love the fact that the interior is kind of the un-minivan. There's obviously pros and cons there, but I do like that about the Carnival. The Sienna, it's just really, really practical up front. A little bit less practical in the back because of those second row seats that don't come out. But for me, the Odyssey is looking just a little bit too old in this generation. So that's what I would do. Let me know what you would do down there in the comments section below. And what do you think about the quirky trying not to be a minivan thing going on with the Carnival? I think it might work a bit better for me if it had all wheel drive, but being front wheel drive and being solidly a minivan, I just wish they would come out and say, you know what, we have the ultimate minivan and just dive into that absolutely no holds barred. Let me know what you think about that. Find us over at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. And I'll see all of you next week.